Hello, my Geesling Legion. This is Robinson Earhart of Robinson's Podcast fame with the introduction for episode nine of Robinson's Podcast. This is a very strong episode, both literally and figuratively. My guest is Patrick Davis. He's the illest PD on Instagram, which you should definitely check out. So he is a bodybuilder and a trainer. He lives in Austin, Texas. We met just before I moved to New York for Columbia. I had been training at this gym called Iron Vault, and I just noticed him. I mean, it's it's pretty hard not to notice him when he walks into a room, but I saw him training other clients and training himself, and I could tell just immediately that he knew what he was doing. And I've spent a lot of time in gyms and reading and researching over the past few years, so I like to think that I... I know what I'm talking about, at least when it comes to what whether other people know what they're talking about. So in this episode, we actually talk pretty much exclusively about Patrick's experience with performance enhancing drugs, because he is an enhanced athlete, whereas I'm what you might call a natural athlete and that I, I don't use performance enhancing drugs. So we talk about how he got into bodybuilding, his experience with performance enhancers, how they've affected his training. He's actually had a, a very positive experience with them, which is not always the case. And certainly, well, I was going to say it isn't the case for most people, but I, I have no idea if that's true. So I don't want to say it. Uh, though at the end of our podcast, we actually do get for maybe like the last 10 or 15 minutes, we get into some training advice. And y if you want to skip to that, or if you get that far, you'll see just how into it, into it he really is, just how, how much he crosses his P's and Q's when it comes to the actual training. Anyway, so I wholeheartedly recommend him as a personal trainer and like i said you should check out his instagram the illist pd after you listen to the episode whether you're an enhanced athlete or a natural athlete or just a lifestyle type of lifter if you're looking for an online coach i highly recommend checking him out but before you listen to this episode i have to say or I have to give a, I don't know, PSA, a notice, a disclaimer. This is not at all an endorsement into taking steroids or any other sort of illegal drugs or even legal drugs like testosterone. That's definitely a personal, very personal decision that you need to make after lots of research, hopefully after consulting with a physician and a trainer like Patrick who really knows what they're talking about. And for some people like him, it is the right thing to do. If you want to be a professional bodybuilder, you can't do it. Well, okay, that's that's also not true. You can be a professional natural bodybuilder, but if you want to be an, an Arnold Schwarzenegger type bodybuilder, you need steroids. And that's what Patrick wants, and it's it's worked out really well for him. And he's, I think, for me at least, he's an, he's an authority on the subject. Now, for other people like me, who don't want to be professional bodybuilders, who don't depend on their level of fitness or hypertrophy for their incomes, who just like training and want to see what their body can do on, on its own, uh, then steroids or other drugs might not be for you. But even if they're not, I still find that it's really helpful to have an understanding of the lay of the steroid land, so to speak, because a lot more people are using them than you realize. And you can't just walk into a gym and compare yourself to everybody without understanding that. They're also just very fascinating, the sort of things people do. So as you'll hear in this podcast, Patrick talks about uh, breast cancer drugs, horse drugs that athletes use. So for me, it's just a, non a nonstop learning experience. Anyway, Without any further ado, I think you're really going to like this episode. So enjoy.
before we get into some of the more specifics, most this isn't a bodybuilding specific podcast, so I'm guessing that most of the people who listen mm-hmm. to this don't know what a bodybuilding competition is actually like. Okay. So what what is uh, just briefly like? How what does the competition look like? As term, okay. far, oh. so far as events go. So I think the important part to remember is that the, the training is basically geared towards bodybuilding, but that's not actually the sport itself. You know, you don't get points for being, you know, the strongest lifter, um, for instance, or for training the hardest. And so I think that can be something that's difficult for people to grasp from the outside. And of course, training harder, being stronger, et cetera, is usually going to lend to success um, within the sport itself. But the sport itself is really just the art of presenting your physique in its highest form with, uh, you know, elite conditioning, um, in competition standard, this usually means uh, sub 5% body fat for males, uh, essentially see through skin where you can really see the full depth of the muscular structure. Yeah. And then of course, the posing, which is just going to magnify, you know, and, and present your muscles in a way that makes them, uh, that makes, you know, the strength and power and size most evident. Nice. I got down to 7.8% in February, and I know I just how brutal By it the is. Way. Sorry? Yeah, it hurts. I said it was very impressive, but it does hurt. But yeah. You can, you can t- oh. understand when I talk about it. It hurts. Yeah, it's it's so brutal. But okay. And how did you personally get into weightlifting? Because I, I feel like there there's a good story there that we didn't get to talk to get to get to talk uh, about when we yeah. when we were training together. I love this uh, story actually. So I started lifting, you know, super young. I was about 12 when I started getting taken regularly um, by my parents to go work out. And so, you know, we had a place where, you know, my dad and my older brother might play basketball, but uh, you know, around age 12, I started taking an interest in weights and did some summer camps uh, at school, you know, to prepare for football and whatnot. So on one hand, I would say that, you know, uh, really football was something that I badly wanted to succeed in. And, um, to be honest, I wasn't the most naturally gifted athlete. I was very fast. But Must be tough for that, a Texan. <laughs> yeah, and that's the thing too. And it's, you know, I mean, people are good, you know, at every level. You know, there's some really impressive athletes. And I wanted to be a part of that. And so I had speed. I didn't feel like I had mastery of the finer elements of the game. And so, you know, I figured the quickest way to boost my status there was just to be larger and stronger. Um, but beyond sports success itself, I would just say the main factor was just feeling small or weak. Um, I was very short, funny enough, uh, in kind of those key formative years where I decided I really wanted to lift. And, um, you know, I started growing at maybe 13 or 14, but I was uh, below five feet for most of middle school. And now you're like and six or so? Yeah, about six feet. 5'11", I identify as six feet. but. Uh, <laughs> But I'm grateful, you know, for that time because it really, you know, I think just lit a fire under my ass that it was like I wasn't ever going to be able to control my height, but that place where I could control, you know, not just my size, but, you know, my idea of how I would be perceived based on that, uh, Mm -hmm. which is once you acquire what you think you wanted, you know, you understand that it's, you know, it's shallow bullshit at the end of the day. I'm still very much the same guy, um, same training mentality that I had back then. It's it's just a longer time, you know, being into it. So, um, but uh, so I'd say my perspective has changed a lot since I started and my reasons have evolved a lot. But that was, you know, kind of the key formative moment to push me, you know, to really aggressively pursuing this uh, uh, game, sport, hobby. Yeah, but I remember, I feel like you had, I know you're a really smart guy because I've seen your posts and the way you talk on Instagram and I've talked to you in person. You. But I know that there was like a tough time. Uh, you had a tough time around college that result. Yes. That, and after that is when you started like really getting into it yeah. and training people. Yeah. And I would say that was the second push, you know, honestly. Uh, yeah. So I succeeded uh, academically, you know, uh, with relative ease, I would say in high school and college, but you know, I had some personal stuff. I, I went to a military college and it was very strict, you know, like we, shaved daily we're inspected every morning we marched uh you know to breakfast you know uh the first five months i was there we surrendered cell phones etc so i got sent home from there uh essentially just for going off campus when i wasn't supposed to um and then signing that i had been present at campus uh and so (laughs) yeah i got sent home um and it's more complex than that but it's not a fruitful use of our time here but so anyway got sent home Uh, my parents divorced the same summer and so just a lot of stability i had kind of dissolved and 
that military school was good just because it really pushed you in the direction of like doing the next task. And without that, I think I really struggled, you know, once I, I transferred to Texas A&M and uh, with everything else going on, you know, uh, got increasingly into drugs. Um, wasn't too bad, actually, when I dropped out of college. Like recreational you know, was, drugs or yeah, performance enhancing? Like, yeah, no, no performance enhancing yet. And so I was just smoking a lot of weed. Um, you know, I was like, playing with like, you know, Xanax a little bit and like a little cocaine and stuff like that, but not um, extensively using it yet at that time. Uh, mostly just smoking a lot, skipping class and kind of depressed. And so once I left school, you know, my heart just wasn't in it. But once I left, I basically just went like all the way down the drug rabbit hole. You know, I was doing drugs that I never imagined, you know, that I would be using. And fortunately for me, pretty quickly after I crossed that line, I like uh, I actually overdosed and I hit rock bottom, but you know, and it was a, it was speedballing. So it's like on one hand I was overdosing and I could feel physical, you know, mental function. I don't know what speedballing is. Oh, so it's a a mixture of uh, cocaine and crack. And so it, um, I think that's the proper name, but the, the drugs, I know it's what it was. So, but, um, it's weird though. Cause you know, cocaine makes you highly alert and have high cognitive function. Um, but you're also like mentally and physically deteriorating at the same time. And so while all this was happening, I was actually having very deep, you know, insightful thoughts, you know, kind of feeling my brain breaking down and arms and hands going numb and kind of like light rigor mortis, honestly, you know, like I I really went. Yeah. And so Hmm. I I looked online that, um, you know, benzodiazepines were administered in, you know, clinical settings to basically offset overdose. And I happened to have some, um, there was some trepidation that they're fake, you know, of course, that they're laced with fentanyl or something like that. It was just very common, you know, more so now. It was like, if I take this thing, I might kill myself, but it's the only thing that's going to save me. It's too shame to call my parents, et cetera. So I took that and I ended up surviving and kind of my heart rate slowed down. Um, I did forget. And one symptom was uh, I was taking radial pulses. Heart was about 60 BPM uh, every 15 second count. So it was like in the, you know, low to mid 200s um, for hours. And then uh, my like involuntary breathing stopped. So if I didn't actively sit there and like, inhale exhale like mentally and tell myself to do it i would just forget and just start going blue in the face but uh while i was going through all this i just really had the thought that if i were to die at that point that i would have accomplished nothing and i was out of college you know i'd kind of left behind my academic backgrounds um didn't really have any job prospects and so i just kind of had to scrap together like what am i good at and i didn't do anything productive with it for probably a couple years like it was a slow process of you know working shitty jobs and not being satisfied or wanting more for myself just little by little. But at that point I did start at least training hard. I didn't know why yet, but I got real serious again, like I'd been when I was younger. And after, you know, getting some significant work experience, I decided, you know, I love to do this and I'm good at it. Like, why don't I give a shot, you know, actually training people. Um, Once that took off uh, or actually before that took off, I I took a position as a uh, physical therapy, like assistant in an office. And I got to train like, you know, probably a dozen people a day, at least in a clinical setting, just racked up a lot of hours, um, a lot of emphasis on functional biomechanics there, but they actually use resistance training or weightlifting for a lot of the rehab. But so I just got really familiar with, you know, how and when things are supposed to move. Like, you know, if you're rowing, for instance, should scapular motion proceed, you know, break of the elbows, stuff like that. Um, when should they be retracted, protracted, elevated, depressed? And getting a handle on that, gave me more control over it was almost unwittingly but it gave me more control over the appearance and just addressing individual muscles versus just becoming stronger and that was part of my shift from training for strength and function into like really trying to cultivate like a specific look um you know because dynamic posture affects static posture and then eventually muscular structure you know the way you move and that's why we see that lots of people who do similar repetitive tasks like uh, for instance football players by position often have very similar physical builds. It's because the physical demands, which, you know, form their shape are identical as well. So, um, but yeah, so that, you know, I got really passionate about that. And then kind of the logical next step, um, you know, to become a trainer was really expanding my profile. And, you know, that shift towards training for aesthetics combined with just a desire to get my name out there, you know, I just kind of arrived at the conclusion that like, I wanted to, you know, compete and try to do a show. Um at the time, I was uh, 
you know, from the athletic world, I kind of frowned on bodybuilding a little bit. And I frowned on, um, you know, just like uh, performance enhancing drugs, just because, you know, one, it's, it's easy, I guess, as an athlete who is, you know, naive and doesn't think that these things exist in ball sports as well. Like, it's easy to see a guy that's bigger and stronger in the gym and be like, oh, they're just on drugs and kind of write them off. And they're not athletic. They can't run. They're all walking on the treadmill. They can't jog a mile if they wanted to. And, you know, so I'd kind of frowned on it, but it just seemed like it was a good fit for what I wanted to do. And, you know, I didn't hire a coach. I was unfamiliar with the structure of the federation and whatnot. I basically just started loosely tracking my eating uh, and increasing cardio. And beyond that, I was just lifting like I normally would. And that was it. I didn't actually pick a show date to compete. I just started getting leaner. And then once I felt like I could start kind of seeing through myself a little bit, I just, you know, got on my computer, looked up shows and picked one. Um, at the show, I would say is where I really fell in love with the process. I'd kind of been not drinking just by choice um, to get through that. But, you know, after already having moved past a lot of drug issues, you know, I ended up kind of unwittingly giving up alcohol for bodybuilding. And, you know, all those things, uh, plus the fact that it actually did kind of garner the attention that I had wanted in the training world and helped really launch my career there and just get my name out there. Um, you know, I just fell in love instantly once that first show was done. And pretty much ever since then, it's been the main focus of my life. Well, okay. I've got a lot of things to say to that one. Um, thanks for your candor and being so open with that story. Uh, you really, yeah, you really had me wrapped with attention there but also uh, a lot to unpack with no interruptions whatsoever so i was like shit like i think i might have given them a little no 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 that that was good i i take notes uh so that was the first thing i wanted to say and the second was uh well i'm really glad that you managed to stay alive uh selfishly too because i mean well we I, I trained with you for three sessions like a little over a year ago just because I'd, I'd watched you at the gym in Austin and seen you work with other clients and I could tell, I mean, I've seen hundreds of coaches, but you're one of the few where I saw you working and knew that you really, you really not only just loved what you did, but knew what you were doing. And just that those three sessions have had a huge impact on my training in the past year. And I've had a lot of development in this past year that I wouldn't have had otherwise. So I'm really glad that you got on this path. And then, thank you. Okay. The last thing I'm going to say before we uh, move on to a different topic is you also just had one of the best uh, natural physiques that I've ever seen. I mean, what's your, what's your Instagram? If it's, List PD. The illest PD. Are there any underscores there? No. Okay. Yeah. So uh, you've got pictures up, but uh, before you started taking per- performance enhancing drugs, you already had like this amazing physique. So I, it's uh, pretty obvious that bodybuilding was was meant for you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So you started competing, and then what was what was going through your mind when you decided to no longer compete as a natural bodybuilder? So that's for people who don't know a bodybuilder that's not taking, uh, any hormones, you know, any exogenous hormones, right? Yeah. So that was, and then to one who did take that. So, yeah, yeah. that for me, I think the biggest thing there was just exposure. You know, I'm kind of mentioned that, When I did my first contest prep, I didn't know any coaches or athletes who competed in it. Um, I had literally never met anyone that had ever done an NPC show when I like kind of NPC stands for that's that's the federation that I alluded to earlier that I you know competed when it was natural. That's a natural federation. No, so it's not. It's that's the big. That's where you go to turn pro and join the IFBB. But when I did my first show, I'd had so little exposure to bodybuilding that it wasn't. it's something I think I would have been willing to do had it been kind of put in my face, but like I just somehow never ended up in that situation where it was really, you know, something that I was around. I think too, coming from the athletic background, that was something that we all took pride in not doing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, 
back then it really mattered to me as my appraisal of, oh, how good is this guy or whatever. Um, you know, to me now, it's like I could care less whether someone's taking something or not. I'm obviously far more impressed by a natural athlete than I would be if that same athlete was enhanced. Right. But I think the most common misconceptions about enhancements is that you don't simply add a drug to your system and, and morph your body. Uh, really, the way it works, is it's like it's like a training boost, right? And so you take stuff. There is things that have an immediate aesthetic effect or a rapid one, but mostly the way that it works, the way that like these crazy transformations happen where you see a guy go from looking, you know, not even necessarily out of shape, just, just very ordinary looking to looking like, you know, these 300 pound gorillas that you see in their traps are going up to their ears and all that stuff. Like that's not just drug administration. What it is, is it's instead of training hard for an hour and 15 minutes, now you can train hard for two hours and 15 minutes Um, and then recover instead of super and then recover instead of being from that. Exactly. The recovery is very accelerated. Um, so your training frequency, your training intensity, uh, duration, um, you know, your nutritional intake without having negative consequences on your body fat, which is then going to basically feed into itself and, make it harder and harder um, to actually add muscle tissue as insulin sensitivity goes down. Like when you can change all these variables, it doesn't, it's not that you're instantly becoming jacked. It's that now you can work twice as hard. So I've, you know, I coach people, I coach both lifestyle clients, which is what we call like people who simply want to look better for the purpose of enhancing their lifestyle versus actually in a competitive setting. Um, I get people all the time that are running ridiculous amounts of stuff and taking far more than anyone that, you know, uh, competes with. Lifestyle clients are taking a lot of stuff, you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people who are just, you know, and that's not to say they're out of shape, but they're just gym enthusiasts. It's not like a a strict life. The diet's not too tightly monitored. And they're just taking heaps of drugs that are, you know, potentially deleterious to their health, you know, especially on arrival when they come to me. And, you know, don't really look different or they're certainly not someone that I would walk by and say, Oh, they're taking steroids at all, much less taking tons of them. So, you know, and you'll have to pardon me. I got far down the rabbit hole on that. I uh, might've gotten away. No, no, this is, this is all really interesting to me. Yeah. I think I mentioned uh, it to you. I, so I didn't realize just how many people in an average gym are on gear, which uh, for people who don't know, that's sort of what people just refer to as steroids. So I've I've just been reading about it more, listening to some podcasts about it more because I've just been astonished. And not that it's, I don't, it's not a, it's not like I'm morally opposed to it, but it's something that I think most gym goers should be aware of so that they're not comparing themselves to everybody they see in the gym. You know, I don't think that using itself is a breach of integrity, but using and then presenting as not using is definitely a breach of integrity. Um, you know, it's just giving yourself credit that you haven't earned. Like I said, you you can you shouldn't be any less impressed with someone for them using gear, but at the same time, an equal physique is less impressive if uh, you know requiring lots of hormonal assistance. You know, I'll give a good example. That's a good like, way of putting it. Put though. a number. On- if you're if you're five nine one ninety five and extremely lean and shredded, and you're natural, that's extremely impressive. Yeah. That is extremely impressive. If you are taking, you know, well, I'll just say, you know, I know guys that compete to be one hundred eighty pounds at say five eight, and they're taking loads of HGH grams of steroids, and it's just like, you know, like I said, same result. It's, that's not very impressive with all that mm-hmm. kind of help, especially over you know years or half a decade or a decade. Um, it was really you know, and that's not tonight. it was really eye opening for me once you and I were standing in front of a mirror and I I'm like I'm 175 pounds and I'm 5'10 and I told you like looking in the mirror like I'd like to be 200 pounds natural and you told me you didn't think it was possible and I'm not saying that you're you're wrong for saying that but I just had in my mind like if I just keep working out, then I'll just get to 200 pounds. But it's not that way. If you're a natural athlete, you don't just pack on slabs of muscle. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, it's just not conducive to that. I mean, it's, you know, it's sort of like an arbitrary point, you know, it's hard to pinpoint an exact Mm -hmm. weight or something like, but it's just wherever that 
line falls, there's a very clear difference in the ability that you have to achieve certain size. Because I'll be honest, I, you know, I was working my absolute hardest. Uh, and I think I worked harder when I was natural than I do now. Um, and that's related to a lot of things. You know, part of it is I told you, I was just not active in other areas of my life at that point in time. So I just had all the time in the world to just, you know, go, I could spend two and a half hours at the gym if I felt like it, you know, now I keep a very busy work schedule, you know, you got relationship, uh, you know, uh, girlfriend has a son, et cetera, you know, so I stay a lot busier. Um, but you know, like I said, working that hard then I was already 12 years, 13 years into training hard, you know, and I couldn't really get past, you know, a, a modestly clean 220. And now it's like, you know, I feel like I haven't had my best year in the gym. And, you know, I, I maintain about 270 pounds, um, you know, it, with very good conditioning, pretty effortlessly. Um, you know, so like I said, most of that was earned by working exceptionally hard for a few years, you know, and getting here. But all I know is like, I wouldn't be maintaining this successfully without the hormonal assistance. Mm -hmm. And I just, I just don't feel like someone could be 270 pounds at my height um, and in good condition without some sort of hormonal assistance. Mm -hmm. So we don't know exactly where the line is, but we do know that a line exists where past a certain point, it's highly unlikely that someone's uh, achieved that look and size without uh, hormonal assistance. So what went into the decision for you to first start uh, taking them? Yeah, so I, I got away from that earlier. So... Um, I kind of had at the back of my mind, like I said, I wasn't really around the crowd yet, but I did know that, of course, that top pros and stuff were using it. So my first show, I wanted to, before I got on, really see what the limit of my natural potential was and just give it a shot and see how that felt. And then the other thing is I mentioned, you know, local level versus national level competition earlier. I felt like it would be best if I was in a position where I was able to succeed at the local level without hormonal assistance. Um, in that way, once I administered it, I felt that I would instantly take that leap of being uh, contentious at the national level. And so I did my first show naturally. I got second place, which is I was extremely proud of, you know, being a self-coach natural on not a strict diet. I was like counting macros and stuff like that, but I wasn't eating the same six meals every day like, you know, most competitors do. And, uh, and you know, I wasn't coached. I, I didn't really know how to pose and my posing was sort of sloppy. Um, and I still walked out with second place and I did nationally qualify. And so once that moment arrived, I spent some time looking for a coach. I was a bit discouraged by the price early on and was just kind of uh, still training hard, but just dieting myself, eating a bunch of you know, pancakes and bullshit, just trying to get as big as possible before I went up there, I had a source and whatnot. But I ended up getting with a coach, um, you know, met some people where I could get a hold of it. And then I started early in the prep for that national show. And so um, the first show I did naturally was in July of 2019. And the national show I was uh, attempting to compete at was in uh, early December of that same year. So December 2019. So I started my first cycle, I believe it was end of August or early September of 2019. Uh, I compete at a weight cap in that category of 212 pounds, which is obviously far in my past. <laughs> um, but at the time, when I did the first show naturally, I cut down to 196. And that's what I checked in at. And so I had 16 pounds of lean tissue, which is a ton. It's a lot more than gaining 16 pounds on a bulk. Like 16 pounds of pure lean tissue that I could gain and stay within my weight cap. And so I felt like I would have plenty of room either way. And so I started, you know, taking steroids at the time. I think, you know, I'd begun cutting for maybe a couple of weeks and I was already back down to like 220. You know, my weight cap's only 212, only eight pounds to lose to fill it out. And I knew I had more body fat than that to lose. So I start taking gear and I start getting leaner, but the scale is just like stuck at 220. Like all of a sudden, like each week, like you can tell I'm getting much leaner, but my body weight just will not change. And so it was becoming, you know, evident, I'd say around uh, early November that I was gaining a lot of muscle tissue because, you know, they do say that you are most responsive your first time. And what were you and taking at that point? So I took, uh, I started off just on 500 milligrams of testosterone a week. And then I think we added Winstraw first. Um, cause I started the test kind of late in prep. Like I want to say I was about maybe 10, 10 to 12 weeks out. Um, cause the original, I ended up dropping this prep, um, and I'll get to that later, but 
uh, I want to say I was 10 or 12 weeks out. I got on the testosterone. And then after about six weeks of testosterone, I started taking uh, 50 milligrams of Winstrol. And what's Winstrol do? And then. So Winstrol is an oral steroid. Um, Stenozolol is the like kind of clinical name for it. But it's an oral steroid. It's a. Uh, especially potent, you know, at giving kind of like a hard and dry look. And it's uh, mostly regarded as it's mostly regarded as a cutter, but it's a uh, anabolic to androgenic ratio is actually, um, you know, I've been told second only to trend or I've read, but um, so it's, it's pretty potent as a mass gainer as well. You wouldn't use it in a bulk context though. It's more so that it helps you preserve a lot of muscle tissue when you're in an extreme deficit. So basically it's like you can get the benefit of, how conditioned you get from eating far under like what your body needs in terms of caloric intake without actually sacrificing that muscle tissue. And so, um, I had the 50 milligrams of Winstrol a day and then I added 50 milligrams of Mastron a day. And so I took that for most of my prep. What's that one? Uh, I also took, sorry. The Mastron, um, it's actually, it's a women's breast cancer drug. Oh, wow. It's another, I I wouldn't have guessed that. Yeah, so, well, and that's one of the benefits of it is, so, testosterone will aromatize into estrogen, like, especially when you're dealing with the bioidentical, you know, testosterone in a day, and, uh, you know, when it converts into estrogen, what you do is you administer what's called an aromatase inhibitor, so, aromatase is the enzyme that converts test into estrogen, the inhibitor binds to the aromatase so that it can't perform this function. Um, and that of course happens just to preserve homeostasis when you introduce really any exogenous hormone, it'll at least attempt to convert, uh, DHT derivatives cannot be converted into estrogen. And so Mastron and Winstrol are both DHT derivatives. They do not aromatize into estrogen and, um, Mastron actually has some properties of a CIRM, so selective estrogen receptor modulator and that also, so you block some estrogen conversion by the aromatase inhibitor preventing the estrogen from existing in the first place. And then whatever estrogen passes through and, you know, gets converted into in itself as free estrogen, you know, in your blood, it's not harmful. It's when it binds to certain receptors, it'll, you know, create things that, you know, we regard as side effects like gynecomastia, et cetera. And so on one hand, the aromatase inhibitor prevents too much estrogen from being created, but whatever, you know, gets through the net there, the, uh, Selective estrogen receptor modulators will basically bind to those receptors that can create harmful side effects. Um, and so Mastron has some properties of that as well. So it, uh, I really like it for, it gives your muscle a very full and round shape. Um, and it makes your striations look a little harder. And as best as I can explain it, it just makes you look harder. Like the muscle doesn't look as like soft and kind of like, you know, cause even big muscles sometimes can look like a little more soft. And like you could push on it, like Mastron gives it that kind of hard granite, um, granny sort of look. And so I took those three things and then I took a uh, clean buterol. And that's actually a bronchodilator for horses uh, by nature. Um, but it increases uh, just like your caloric expenditure, hmm. really just elevates your metabolism, heart rate, etc. And so it just makes it burn more fat quicker is really how it's used. Um, and so... Yeah, I was taking all those things and just the combination of it all, you know, like I said, I was so far below my weight cap. I was just so responsive to the androgens. And I think a large part of that is because I spent so much more time, you know, building this signaling in my body for like, you know, anabolic processes just by training hard and eating a diet. You know, my body was already so primed to do that, that once it had hormonal assistance, I think it was just very efficient versus somebody who doesn't have a training background and is really taking hormones ultimately to get them to a level that they could have achieved naturally anyway. You know, I'm a big believer that the longer you wait and the more you accomplish without it, the more potency that you'll get out of it because it's being applied to like a stronger system, Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. But, uh, yeah. So once I got on though, anyway, very long story short, I couldn't make weight anymore at 212. Like I grew so fast, I couldn't make weight. So we were fighting and fighting for me to lose weight. But even as I got leaner, my scale weight was just going up. And then, um, that's like everybody's dream. I ended up, (laughs) yeah, well, and you know, I I was real upset at the time, you know, because no one wants to feel like a quitter, you know, and I blame myself for a lot of it. And, um, it just, I don't think anyone would have predicted that I would have gone that quickly. You couldn't move up to another weight class for the competition. I could have, I had no idea, you know, I, I didn't really understand the sport or the principle, you know, and 
men's physique probably would have been the only realistic option at that time. And I didn't even, I'm not sure if I really understood what that was or like the posing and like, you know, so it just wasn't really an option. So, um, anyway, I get done with prep. I've been dieting and really struggling to get like below 220. Um, you know, I started eating basically like, you know, above maintenance right after I dropped that prep. And like within, I want to say like two weeks, I was 250 pounds. Oh, wow. And still still very lean. (laughs) And so it was like, I think, you know, how do I say? Without oversimplifying, the hormones, I think were, they were craving that food. Mm -hmm. You know, just all the stimuli, hormones, the hard training, all this stuff, my body's starved. And, uh, you know, we see this at the end of most, if not all contest preps, if dieted correctly. When you're in a prolonged deficit like that, your body's insulin sensitivity and nutrient partitioning is so much more efficient that you can often consume thousands of calories over, you know, what you would normally consider breaking maintenance and into a surplus. You can go thousands of calories beyond that, gain almost no body fat. Um, the most drastic one I've had after competing in a men's physique show, funny enough, at 219, I could cut more weight than I thought, you know, a year later. But uh, I competed at 219, and I think it was seven weeks later, I was 283 pounds. Um, and that must have been fun. Not bone dry. Not bone dry. Actually, it was miserable. Really? Um, I wasn't. Yeah. You weren't I'll eating fun stuff? Second, no, I wasn't bone dry shredded, but I was like still very like I definitely had visible ab separation and all that stuff. I'd say about until I got like over 270 that time. But so I was still, you know, at times like 265, 268 and like very like conditioned. Um, but no, that wasn't fun. Back then I was coached for preps, but I was doing my own thing in off seasons, which is just the time that you grow. And because I felt like I had that dialed in pretty well. But what I would do back then was – you know, my body favors being actually leaner and thinner. So I, I have to eat extreme amounts of food to push it towards that muscle growth. But the plus side of that is that fat accumulation has seldom been an issue, you know, and that's of course combined with, uh, training and nutrition. But, you know, I just, I, I feel that there's a bit of a genetic predisposition there, um, whether by nature or nurture, you know, that's just where my body trends. Um, and, uh, shoot, I'm so sorry. I lost no, my No, you're totally fine. Where was, where was I going? Uh, my question was why it wasn't fun getting up to 283 because to me the idea of just eating dirty uh and gaining 50 pounds is like heaven well so that's the thing so thank you for getting me on track there so i felt at the time i hadn't really been familiarized with diet structures that would allow me to consume you know seven eight thousand calories just with clean food so um i basically was just you know, I always got my protein intake to try and capitalize on whatever carbs and fats I was eating, but like the nutrient sources were so bad. I mean, like I would go to IHOP and get like a stack and then like a body or something like that, you know, to get some protein on it. Plus whatever was in the pan. Well, I remember but, at the gym, but, you would have like bags of Haribo and bowls of cereal and stuff yeah. like while, while coaching. Eggs. Yeah. Cereal, pop tarts. Um, a lot of fast acting sugars, usually on either side of training, as where you. But it wasn't fun uh, for you. Using that, not at a point. I mean, like you know, it's like you you spend a day doing like IHOP water burger, like you know, you know, maybe some home cooked food and some garbage snacks out of the pantry. I mean, you do that and eat well past your comfort level each meal every day for like six weeks, and it's all like high glycemic like shit foods that'll give you you know lethargy and just make you feel terrible Mm -hmm. elevate your blood pressure you know just overall it was not good for my health um at the time if i looked good and and wasn't fat i felt that i was healthy i didn't really understand uh, what's going on beneath the hood stuff like that and so um and that's so much more important too when you are using anabolics you know really uh I, i feel honestly that they can be relatively safe if you know taken as directed and basically if you aren't pushing the envelope elsewhere like if you're taking steroids i don't think that alcohol is a good idea i don't think that recreational drugs are a good idea um nicotine i will admit that's kind of my uh my vice right now but that i do but that's really not ideal to combine with steroids because you're already elevating blood pressure and then you're you know uh adding vasoconstriction to it so you know you really want to be sharp on nutrition everything else if you are going to use that so um, was it and so, was it scary for you the first time you started taking them because i mean you you had the experience some scary experiences yeah. with the recreational drugs oh. so i don't know if this was like uh t-ball for you 
was it was no 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 so um just like it was more so like constant paranoia it was like i became a hypochondriac the first time i got on gear so i wasn't actually scared of it but i was constantly thinking like i remember it was so funny like i started like peeling through my hair after like every shower because like your hair's wet you know and so you could see your scalp and my hair wasn't that long to begin with at the time but like basically my head would get wet and then i'd be like oh my god i think i'm thinning and like I remember like taking pictures of the top of my head all the time. I'm doing that oh, now. Oh, my girlfriend. Like, <laughs> I think I'm losing hair, you know. And uh, sure enough, like two years later, and you know, a lot of you know, I've taken lots of things since then that would favor you know knocking some hair out. But uh, it's held up pretty fine. So, but it was just stuff like that. Yeah, I was like patting down my nipples all the time to make sure I wasn't getting breast development, mm -hmm. and just uh, yeah, I just didn't ever trust or feel secure that I was healthy um in that first cycle but once i got off so i now just like cruise testosterone if i'm off of everything else i'll just take like a low baseline dose of you know exogenous and test. that's to maintain but, um, what you have basically yeah it's, it's so you don't i mean you know you'd hate to put your body through all that just to you know totally come off and fuck it all up you know because then it's like why you know it's not that that's a less healthy option it's just like why do it at all you know if you're going to go that route that's kind of my opinion and then two just like i mean at that point if you've been taken for a prolonged amount of time like uh you know i'm still young but at a certain point it's necessary to like maintain sexual function and stuff like that like because your body's not going to rebound and start reproducing its own you know I'm, I'm 28 now so my body's still cooperating and if i want to come all the way off or you know even just take take a week or two off it's like i'll rebound um you know, within about seven days, but you know, I'd say a lot of people taking and using this stuff are in the thirties and forties and your body's just not in that prime condition to restart that process without, you know, some other exogenous hormone like a uh, HCG is a really popular one. If your exogenous test production shut down, it uh, stimulates the testes to produce sperm. And that's actually like what precursors puberty. So it's basically you go take that and put it in your back in yourself. Like, you know, you're, going back through it and it kind of restarts that process uh, very much the same as the first time it happens. So, so there's, there's remedies, you know, if you come off and stuff like that um, and just kind of want to transition back into being natural, but it's not just like something that you can just like do and, and know for a fact that everything's going to come back. To Have you ever had any negative side effects? Uh, yeah. I mean, um, it's definitely mood altering. Okay. So if, this is my opinion. It, it makes you more of what you already are, um, personality-wise. So for people who are very relaxed, I don't think that it's too uh, – it, I don't feel that it negatively affects your temperament too much. But like for someone that's already that way, it's going to amplify a lot. And that definitely takes some just experience and maturity to just know that not all the thoughts are really – about something a lot of it is being amplified and blown up emotionally by a high level of hormones and stress in your body um it does stress the body out and so that's something you always have to pay mind to uh i would say personally um i'll get thinner hair when i take dht derivatives um i might have lost like you know my forehead might be a little taller in the corners but you know for for what i've taken i wouldn't say that i've suffered it much might just hair have loss. been aging you know, it's, too it's, full and that's the other thing it could be i mean i was it's how do i say some some people in my family have it it's like 50 50 but um i don't think i have the male pattern baldness predisposition so i shouldn't suffer too much hair loss the way that usually tends to work is only people who have the predisposition anyway will lose their hair from taking steroids it'll just happen much faster mm -hmm. than it would have uh, what else uh, I've, I've had the beginnings of gynecomastia. Like you'll just get like a little bud in your nipple or whatever. But the thing is, is these, you know, hormonal processes are, you know, I mean, people can fully change your gender nowadays. So it's like, you can take medicines to push yourself in either direction. So if you're getting a little extra, you know, in your nipples, there's a, obviously an estrogen issue at the root of that. And, you know, various, you know, controls of estrogen, progesterone, et cetera, can usually snuff that out and make it go away. So funny enough, I've actually had that emerge and then disappear you know half a dozen times for me you know? i just i've just uh, it's, it's embarrassing but i have like naturally puffy nipples and when i get when i get Same. fatter the, it just that just like Same. comes in Eat a lot. yeah i don't know why when it, 
Ours is worse. Or if I like smoke pot, mm. that'll definitely inflame them too. Um, cause I noticed I didn't smoke any weed at all for, I think it was about four months this year. And I noticed that like they were, I don't know, they just look different, mm-hmm. you know? So, um, but, uh, other side effects, man, uh, I've been very fortunate actually, you know, I wouldn't say that, especially in my early years, I was the safest with my health just regarding dosages, length of cycle. Uh, I always took everything I was supposed to with it to kind of mitigate any risk, but I wasn't always eating the healthiest food. You know, I mentioned using nicotine, um, you know, smoking weed. I, I don't know if that really has negative effects there, but, um, anyway, hasn't really had any negative effect on my blood work. Um, maybe right after a show, I might have like slightly elevated liver enzymes because you've been, you know, putting liver toxic stuff through your body. And that's more uh, common in a pre-contest uh, context. Uh, you don't see as much of that in the year round scheme of things, but you know, otherwise um, I haven't really had any like elevated or like fucked up values really, pardon me. Um, so, but I've been lucky in that aspect too. You know, that's a genetic factor in bodybuilding that people don't really talk about a lot. You know, a lot of people talk about someone's ability to, you know, accumulate muscle or be lean or this or that. But, you know, some people can just tolerate a lot of this stuff and some people cannot tolerate much at all, Mm -hmm. you know? And so on the one hand, while I've been fortunate to have very few side effects, I would say that the likelihood of being so lucky is not common. You know, it's kind of 50, 50 shot, I think. Mm -hmm. So, I wouldn't want to like underplay, you know, the possible danger. So this is a a more deep question, I guess. But so I, and I'm sure a lot of other people that are into weightlifting or bodybuilding have body image issues. And so like 10 years ago, there was a point where I was so upset about having puffy nipples that I like considered like getting a surgery to get like that bud behind the nipple removed and i wonder like if you feel that being on gear has it all has negative implications for your mental health like it it just i mean you're chasing something you're like chasing being the hulk something that you can never be so i can (laughs) but uh (laughs) But, Brian, but, I mean, uh, you do look I like the Hulk. That, I mean, a lot of people probably think that the first I'm, time they see you. I thought I thought of you as like I'm, kind of like a beast man, he man, when I first saw you in the gym. Also, of course. Um, so I have a lot to say about this. Actually, I love this question. Um, two separate questions, though. I would say to an extent, because has it been negative for my mental health at time? Yes, steroids have been. Um, not with regard to body image though. Okay. Um, and then bodybuilding itself, the sport more so than steroids, I would say have the negative outcome on my body image, uh, or has the potential to, because personally I don't struggle uh, with it a ton, but I'll break that all down. So first bit, um, the steroids themselves, that's the biggest highlight I could say about them is they will undoubtedly, um, if utilized correctly, increase the, the body image satisfaction of, of people who use them if they're willing to put in the training and the time because it quite literally just gives you potential to get to your goal faster regardless of what that is. You know, even uh, endurance athletes utilize, you know, forms of performance enhancing drugs. And so it's like whatever look you want or feat you want to achieve, you can get there faster by manipulating hormones. And, uh, you know, me speaking from experience, I mentioned that, you know, I, I felt small when I was younger and that was a large, uh, you know, driver for me finding the sport. Now I overcame the feeling of being like inadequately small, like really long time ago. Like I felt like by even eighth grade, I felt very muscular and, um, you know, I've kind of had confidence in that sense, but, um, I didn't feel large until I would say I got on steroids. Like I felt muscular, I felt very fit and in shape, but I didn't feel like like a large human being, and that was something that I'd wanted. And I, you know, I think steroids, you know, definitely laid to rest any worry I've ever had about that. Or like, you know, if you're on a date with your girl, you know, and you're like, see a guy that's huge or something, and like, I don't know about you, I'm like the jealous type. Like, I want to be the big guy, mm-hmm. you know. And so it's like, shit like that used to bother me sometimes, or like that people couldn't see 
how muscular mm-hmm. I was. Cause like when you're natural, it doesn't show as much mm-hmm. in your shirt. Like you kind of have to take it off. And so I kind of just liked that security of knowing that I don't have to prove anything. I don't have to tell anybody my bench press. I don't, I don't need to put on like how strong I am. Cause it's like, it's, it's shown, I feel like, you know, by what I look like. And so in that aspect, I would say that, you know, taking steroids has made me more, plus training a diet, of course, has put me in a position to feel better than ever about my body. Um, now for the negative body image stuff, I would say it's the sport itself because it's like in the realm of just like living life, I'm 120% satisfied with my physique. I love it. I'm very happy. Um, but in the competitive context, it's like not even close to what my goals are. You know, I want to be like an elite bodybuilder at the global level and I'm still, you know, I'm around the corner. I feel from, you know, going pro, I'm going to take a little more time to grow, but I do have sufficient shape once I gain the size, you know, necessary to be, you know, very good and have a lot of success in this. But, you know, I would say that now it has gotten better from bodybuilding, but there was definitely times early in my career where I wasn't even close yet to where I wanted to be, where I was like, uh, where it made me feel really shitty about myself. You know, I mean, when you start comparing yourself to such a small proportion of people, because even at the amateur level in bodybuilding, I mean, you're looking at probably the, you know, the 10,000 or 10,000 of the most well-developed and well-shaped physiques on earth out of a population of 8 billion people. You know, it's like, it'd be like comparing your earnings to the top 0.0001% you know, but, and using that as a basis to say, oh, I'm poor, I have a shit work ethic, or I haven't put in enough work, I'm lazy, you know, and so it's like, I'm looking at all these people who are truly global elites, and at the time, I was very fit, but certainly nothing out of the ordinary, and it'll get in your head, or just your placement at a show, like, I got fifth place at a show, and I, you know, by anyone else's standards, I would have looked great, you know, my body looked great, but I got, you know, they told me that four people look better than me on the same day. And like, I'm not gonna lie. I wanted to f- fucking jump off a building. Like after I got out of that show, you know, obviously I had some perspective by the time I went to sleep, but that burned. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was pain. Like, so, you know, and if you're real competitive and it's such a vulnerable thing to compete about, you know, uh, it can be tough, but I've gotten better with that. I would say, um, the most important thing and the most important advice that I would impart to anyone anywhere on their fitness journey is you need to find a balance of wanting more for yourself and wanting to achieve a goal, but also enjoying the process and where you're at. Because, you know, we talked about my natural physique a lot at the time, you know, I just wanted my traps to touch my ears and, you know, I just wanted to be bolting out of a shirt. And like, I I wasn't appreciative of it at the time, I don't think. And it's like, when I look back now, I'm like, wow, that was actually really cool. You know, um, that was impressive, you know? And so I wish maybe that I had enjoyed it a little more, And so that's something that I've tried to find now, you know, it's like always, it's okay to have ambition without translating that into like negative, um, you know, appraisal of your own current situation. Like you can want more without hating where you are now. And I think that's just something really important for everyone to try and work on because it's definitely something that has to be worked on. You know, it's not just this innate like understanding, like you have to really think through it and, and pay mind to be grateful for where you're at, but also you know, keep your eye on the ball and, uh, not stop improving. I spoke with a female bodybuilder. Who's also a coach. Her name's Abigail Biddle. And she was telling me that she sees bodybuilding in particular as a powerful tool for victims of sexual assault, because it can be used to help them feel comfortable and powerful in their own bodies again. And, That reminds me of what you're saying. My own experience, though, has been completely different in that bodybuilding hasn't helped with my image because even when I do achieve goals, the goalposts just shift. So I lose weight and I get to 7.8% body fat and somehow I still feel fat or I put on 10 pounds of muscle and I still feel weak but i think that's more of a personal thing and bodybuilding doesn't have to be that way for everybody though it's i mean i'll give you credit where it's like if someone's already having those feelings and then you go enter like the hardest pissing match of physique comparison (laughs) in the world like you're almost setting yourself up no that's very insightful so (laughs) you know 
especially if you are natural. I mean, you're you're looking at people with a completely different context of like the thing you have to remember is it's like me at you know two seventy five, like you know in good shape, and me at you know equal condition. You know, I was one ninety six at my lightest, but I probably in this kind of body fat would have been about like two hundred five to two fifteen. You know, but it's like we're the same guy doing the same shit. But that's the difference of like on mm-hmm. versus off. Um, you know, and to be fair, I, I feel that my natural physique was something that a lot of people may struggle to achieve, uh, you know, with enhancements, um, not limited by genetic potential, but just what they're willing to do to get there. But, um, you know, I think that's like the ratio of like what to expect the difference to be. And so it's like, if you go look at people that look a certain way, but you don't realize they really have an extra 30 pounds or 40 or 50 pounds than what they would really have if they were making the decisions you were, it's going to toy with you for sure. And that's where I was saying steroids do help with body confidence is because it's just like, whether you're taking them or not, you're comparing them to a lot of people taking them. And it's not just competitive bodybuilders. It's your fucking doctor. You know, like, it's like, you know, you, you just see some, you know, maybe older gentlemen in public and like, oh man, you're in crazy shape. And they got veins, you know, crawling all over their forearms or maybe they're, you know, just jacked or whatever. And I used to see people like that and just be like, oh, that's just a good focused, you know, whatever. And usually they're taking at least, you know, TRT, if not full blown running mm-hmm. cycles. Like it's just, I didn't, I thought only the biggest right. freakiest looking people were taking right. gear, but close, to, you know, and it's like, so you're never going to get an honest appraisal of yourself, unfortunately in this space, because the space is largely dominated by performance enhancing usage, you know, even at the, the enthusiast right. level. I, I just, it just boggles my mind how much I didn't realize that when now, if you go into a planet fitness or something like that, maybe half or a third of the men have dabbled in steroids at some point and you, you just yeah, wouldn't yeah. have realized that. Yeah. You would never guess, you know? Um, and, uh, but there's other perspectives, you know, because I'm, you know, I hate to say this, it's not politically correct, but someone who's completely out of shape and has put little to no effort in developing their physique is going to watch what you said and identify with it. But they're not in the same boat as you because it's like, you're working your ass off. Like you're getting shredded. You're, you know, I've, I've seen you train meticulously for hours and tracking all your food. It's like, I, I hate to see someone like you be comparing themselves to a bunch of people on gear, you know, and, and just, uh, not giving yourself the credit for not taking it. But on the flip side, I also hate to see someone that has put zero skin in the game as far as developing their own goals. And then they look at you being super lean and then they say, oh, he's got to be on steroids right? without even what kind of work it takes, you know. And so it's like it goes both ways mm-hmm. for sure. Um, just as far as, uh, you know, I don't know. It's just a complex issue for sure. Yeah. Like is. there's two, you know, it's like I would argue both sides of like the opposition. Yeah, I really – I. I do not appreciate it when people moralize against steroids because I think it's just a choice like anything else. And there are good reasons to take them and there are good reasons not to take them, but it's very much a personal issue. And that being said, yeah. so when you're working with your clients, obviously you have natural and enhanced athletes. How do you uh, help them with that decision or how, for who do you think it's right? No. Well, actually, no, so that's a lie. So I help them with the decision in that uh, I try to present the facts of what it is, how it's used, and what to expect, um, just as objective as possible, really. You know, I just explain in full the benefits um, and maybe quell some of the objections that aren't actually realistic, but I also highlight the risks, um, explain the boundaries that you kind of have to adjust in order to accommodate incorporating something like that in your life. For instance, like, uh, you know, personally, I, don't, I chose to stop drinking when I and incorporating, you know, performance enhancing drugs, um, shortly before actually, but at any rate, you know, I personally don't think that they're very compatible, you know, so I want to make sure if someone's mulling it over, you know, one that they're fully aware of all the pros and cons. And then the other side for me is mentally fit to even recommend it, you know, like I would recommend it to someone who is healthy And, um, and obviously the decision's still theirs. That's the first thing I tell them, you know, I'm going to make suggestions. Uh, I'm going to help you make an informed decision, rather what I would say, but it's always their choice, you know, and that even goes for my contest prep athletes. 
Like I don't take people to stage and be like, you have to take this drug and that can cost quality, but it also creates uh, a ton of trust. And, you know, I've actually been shocked at how important that factor has been to people that I coach as bodybuilders, how much they feel like previous coaches, like it was like, they didn't have a choice. Like if their coach wanted them to take it, they're not going to outright force them to, but they're going to very strongly push and push and suggest and suggest until it's like, you don't even have a choice. Um, you know, and it's while they can be helpful in contest scenarios, it's like, it's just not my choice to make at the end of the day. That's a big decision. Um, but kind of circling back to where I left off with the lifestyle folks, like, uh, well, here's, here's a good example, you know, and obviously I'm not going to name anybody, but you know, I got, I got made aware that, uh, someone I was working with was, uh, you know, was, or is, you know, had kind of dealt with drugs and distribution and stuff like that. And it was kind of something a little the, the scary. And so instantly, the... okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so instantly I can't even recommend this guy to get on anything because it's like, if he's this idiot's going to go, you know, do some cocaine or some shit while he's doing all this stuff, he's going to mm-hmm. die. And then they're going to come to me like for explaining what this and that does. And they're going to say that, that, you know, it's like, it's huge risk for me. It's risk for them. Like, so there are certain people that I think are either too young, too immature, um, not financially stable enough. Um, they're making poor life decisions. You know, there's a lot of people that are definitely not fit for it. Like there's a lot of just deal breakers where it's like, if this describes you, you absolutely shouldn't be using stuff. For all the people who don't um, have issues there, generally speaking, you know, I would favor it. You know, of course, I I have one life to live and I chose it. So, of course, I would favor it. But, um, you know, even still with them, I just suggest uh, some say um, or not suggest. I just explain. And then some opt to use and, um, you know, some don't. And I would really say I'm trying to think. I think maybe one or two people have like run it for the first time under my direction. So most people who come to me with their mind made up in a certain way, um, stay that way. It's very rare that I actually get to witness Mm -hmm. conversion basically. Um, and usually if they do change their mind, it'll take, uh, well, actually I had someone reach out to me yesterday in the lifestyle side that it had kind of been discussed briefly. Um, and for him, it was more a TRT thing. Uh, he had uh, experimented with like some pro hormones, which are basically just like cheap over the counter steroids. Uh, he kind of had in like college years and not running a testosterone base. And, um, you know, for those familiar, that can be really deleterious to basically shut down of natural production using those compounds in that way. And so for him, it was just more an issue of like, you know, function and stuff like that, you know, um, but yeah, so that I think was maybe, you know, six to eight weeks between the initial asking me about it, me sharing my thoughts, and then, you know, close to two months later, reaches out and says, hey, you know, I'm going to go to the urologist and have a discussion with them, um, you know, and then, uh, you know, most people though don't go through a doctor, honestly, like if they're trying to run stuff to get big, like most of like most everything but testosterone and a couple other compounds for like you know, cancer and age, their AIDS patients, basically like they're not going to prescribe you that stuff. You know, they might give you like testosterone for like, just, yeah, having a, you know, high normal test level at the max. They're not going to give you, you know, super physiological levels decided or uh, required to be really successful in bodybuilding anyway. So most people who are taking them purely for aesthetic purposes are kind of experimenting for themselves with it. Uh, won't acquire it from a doctor. Okay. Well, we have like really run the gamut on gear. So this is going to be my last gear related question. Then maybe I'll, I'll throw you a couple of training related questions. Cause I know you've got so much to say on that and then we'll, we'll call it a day, but just in general. So bodybuilders aside, just lifestyle clients, how do you treat or coach enhanced and natural athletes differently? So obviously people are going to have different goals, but are there any blanket ways in which you have to treat them differently? And and just to clarify, this is enhanced versus natural, not lifestyle versus This is enhanced versus natural lifestyle clients, so not bodybuilders. Okay. Um, 
Not really, okay. honestly. Like their intake levels, like people taking gear normally can consume more food. But, you know, I'll say this. It's like sampling bias because it's like a lot of – if someone is devoted enough to seek a coach and they're still staying natural, like their P's and Q's are probably pretty like sorted out. You know what I mean? Like if someone's enough of a fitness enthusiast as natural to approach me, then they're normally pretty, you know, rock solid airtight. And usually it'll be someone like you that's very lean, um, in great shape, but just wants to add some more muscle tissue. Um, so, you know, take a guy like that prototype versus someone who is enhanced, but isn't training that hard. Their diet sucks and they got some body fat on them. So typically I would say like the simple answer would be, you know, the people taking gear can do a few more sets and they can eat some more food. But also I feel like my average natural client is more fit than my, than my, uh, enhanced client just because for lifestyle, because it's like someone who's devoted enough to have a coach at all as a natural is probably about as devoted as like a bodybuilder on gear. Um, there are a lot of people who just like, you know, they like hitting some, some chest, some arms and, you know, maybe some back if they're lucky a few times a week, run a shit ton of gear and like eat pizza and don't hit their protein, you know? So, um, that's more common, honestly, like on the lifestyle side, but also too, speaking of sampling bias, like I don't think I'm typically considered a source for like weight loss purely, you know, people who are just completely deter or, uh, deconditioned and need to like get in shape starting from nothing like the people are usually people who want to get really big and muscular and so that's either going to be like a natural guy that's like already in great shape on the precipice of getting big or it's going to be someone who is you know uh enhanced loves the gym loves the gear but isn't very tight on like the training or the details um and then of course if someone is both super dedicated on the diet training etc and taking gear then they're probably just a bodybuilder at that point, they're probably competing. Um, most people I know that are super strict on everything and taking gear, it's like at that point, it's like you basically already are a competitor, so you might as well just step on a stage and do it. Okay, well, you are absolutely the right person to have this conversation with. Uh, really, Thank you. so I'm, I'm really so thankful that you did. You answered a lot of questions that I've had for a while. But so now, just because I, I know we're over an hour. I just want to ask a couple about training really quick. So okay. I'm fine. on time. Okay. So I'm going to ask you about a couple of things that I think are staples of bodybuilders, but that I just haven't ever really incorporated into my training, but I've seen you, I've seen you do one of them a lot. And I've heard you talk about doing the other one. And the first is just partial reps. So a partial rep is for people who don't know, it's just not going through the full range of motion on an exercise like a, a bicep curl or something like that. But I don't know how to use them really. And I never do. So obviously, I mean, you can incorporate them into different exercises, but how do you think about partial reps? Okay. So in a compound movement, you're going to recruit a variety of muscles in the, the, key thing that indicates a compound versus an isolation is that your prime mover is going to change throughout the range of motion. And so let's say I'm bench pressing and if I go through my full range, I'm recruiting, you know, uh, chest, shoulders, and triceps as a prime mover at some point in that movement. If I'm really using that, like let's say in a bro split, right? And for anyone who's not, you know, up to speed on that, it's a bro split is a concept of training like a single muscle group, you know, each day in the split. So you're not doing like a, you know, you're not doing like a mixed upper body day with like chest and back. Like you do, you know, chest, then legs, then off, then uh, back, then arms and shoulders, right? So, and that's your weekly schedule. And so if you're in a bro split, right, and it's chest day, I'm already training shoulders and triceps later. I'm still getting some activation of it within the workout, but I'm really trying to devote all my energy to just doing maximal, you know, damage to my chest basically. But also then, because I'm on a bro split, having a full week for my chest to recover. So you're getting the, you know, the maximal stress on it to induce growth. And then you're also giving it plenty of recovery. And so I want to kind of keep a little gas in the tank on shoulders and triceps so that, you know, I can go full tilt on them later in the week and that they can be fully recovering. And so on a bench press, for instance, we're actually going to see the most chest activation from about 90 degrees and up. And I would really say I like about two inches off my chest, right? 
And so rather than taking the bar all the way down to my chest where I'm really starting to, you know, you see my pecs stretching until I hit about that point. And then once I get there, now anterior delt stretching and then a lot of the tension's moving into the triceps. So I feel like, especially if you're not applying equal pressure throughout the entirety of the press and you're really exploding from depth with the bar on your chest, that big push is really coming from your shoulders and your triceps at that position. And then your chest is just kind of uh, capitalizing on momentum to finish out the rep. So from like a force production standpoint, you're doing a better lift if you're doing your full range of motion. But if your goal is really just to isolate the pectoral, you really just want to focus on the portion of range of motion that's going to target that most effectively. And that's going to be true for any compound movement if you're trying to like just bias a single muscle. Um, in isolation movements, it's really just about like maximum recruitment and like what range of motion you get that. And so you mentioned the bicep curl as an example. With the arm fully locked out, you're going to be re- – one, putting a lot more stress on the tendons. And then two, you're going to be, you know, recruiting a lot of tension in your forearms. And so if you start at about, I would call it, you know, if we're treating our arm as a lever, it's, you know, going to be about 45 degrees above horizontal. So that's your start point. You already have tension on your bicep. It hasn't let go and fully stretched. And then you just go from there to full lockout without ever fully stretching it. And you're going to keep the tension on your bicep for a larger proportion of the lift versus fully letting your arm stretch and hang and then bringing it all the way back up every time. So as a person who's interested in, you know, strength, you know, functional strength, um, performance based metrics, uh, range of motion is going to be hugely important as somebody who's focused on, uh, individual hypertrophy of muscles, you know, it's often beneficial and actually superior lifting form to exclude certain parts of your range of motion so that you're more focused uh, on the task at hand. Okay. Well, that was, that was a really great answer. And then, so the second question I had was, I've never really used a Smith machine. So for people who don't know what a Smith machine is, it's pretty much like a a barbell and a squat rack, except the bar is pretty much attached to the rack and it, in a fixed, uh, and it moves in a fixed up and down or sometimes at a slant pattern. But you wanted to train with me one day at a different gym so we could use a Smith press or Smith machine. So what is it that you like to use the Smith, Smith machines for in particular? It's easier. So the, the human body has a tendency to move in like, uh, with somewhat of an arc in the bar path. And so if you're really for a bench press or for all movement or for all bar, press, all, you know, um, okay. Other movements where it's actually easier to maintain a straight bar path, but like, um, you know, for optimal recruitment of my chest, uh, on a bench press, You know, it's like I can either, you know, deal with the arc or I can go with a Smith machine where it's locked in a straight path and then just align the bench, you know, to that bar to a point that targets like exactly the strand of fibers basically that I'm going for. And so I just feel like I get a lot more control over precisely like where I'm feeling the tension and the squeeze if I'm on that fixed bar path um, because then I can basically just set up my position, you know, whether I'm standing over it doing a pull or underneath it doing a press, I can really find the perfect angle and stay precisely on it. Now I have moved away from the Smith a little bit just because or actually a lot. And that's just because it was really my preferred choice for chest training, but I had a partial tear in uh, late December, early January, like right around new year's. And it was on the bench press. It's, at times been a bit problematic, um, just, uh, kind of where my pec like meets like my anterior delt and my bicep, just where all that stuff ties in. And so I've found a lot more comfort lately on converging chest press machines. So like a hammer press, something like that. Um, the tough part there is that it's not a given at every gym you train at. Like, uh, you know, of course we were training at iron vault gym and, uh, it's more barbell and dumbbell, you know, and some cables. So they don't really have the space for the hammer presses and stuff. But what I like about that is, a full chest contraction is really going to require you to sort of go from wide to narrow, basically, you know, your hands spread when you go back and then kind of converge when you go forward, you're just going to get a fuller pectoral contraction versus if your hands are, you know, I'll try to make it fit the screen, but equal width, you know, you want them start wide finish. Cause then you get that pull towards your sternum that really creates a maximal contraction. But, uh, you know, to be fair and play devil's advocate there, you know, hammer press machine, for instance, is also going to put you back on an arc. So it's pros and cons, you know, no one thing is perfect. I don't think that there's necessarily a, uh, how do I say an objectively superior, you know, training methodology or, uh, 
what's the word I'm looking for? Training modality, right? So I think you can definitely find a lot of ways to make a lot of different tools work well for you. And honestly, I think a balance of different movement patterns just to get that full kind of 360 degree development is actually really helpful versus just doing the same movements constantly. Um, but that being said, the exercises themselves, I think, are pretty cut and dry, consistent as far as what makes a complete hypertrophy program. You know, like vertical pulls and horizontal pulls and just like, you know, an incline press, a, a flat press. So it's like it doesn't matter if it's like a pin loader machine that's converted or if it's, you know, a Smith machine or just a barbell or a dumbbell. Um, I think it's a good idea to get a variety of those. But like the actual movements themselves, like without those variations, are still basically the same skeleton. Okay. And okay, so one one last thing I'm just curious about. So I'm training at this gym called Quads in Chicago, which I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it's an absolutely amazing gym that blows every other gym I can think of out of the water. They have like the full line of hammer strength equipment, full line of Ivanko, just like everything. And one thing they have that I've never seen before is a tibia raise, a hammer strength tibia raise. Yeah. So the front of the shin. Yeah. And I wonder if that's something that you've ever done or if bodybuilders ever pay attention to the tibia. No, but I've actually thought about that because, um, you know, it's often discussed, you know, that the best bodybuilders pay attention to the details. You know, it's like the real hardcore guys, it's like their adductors, for instance, are locked on, Mm -hmm. uh, calves, hamstrings. Those are kind of tells of someone who's rear delts. Those are tells of someone who's really locked into the details. Lower traps is another one. Um, no one ever talked about the tibia. You know, and um, it's actually a fairly large muscle. I don't know if it's the most aesthetic. Um, I think just from driving, the one on my right leg is just huge. Um, it like really, yeah, just yeah. out of my leg like hard, and it's it's really firm too. Like it's it's pretty, uh, yeah, it's just thick. Like I remember, I was at the gym, and uh, you know, it was one of my clients. Um, you know, that we, we we would always talk when we were working out at the gym, but yeah, one, so what do you call it? The rack, it moves in the squat cage. And he was like trying to like, you know, repeg one of them and dropped it. And it hit me like straight in the shin. And I like didn't even feel it. Oh God. It, it was like cut and bleeding, but my, was it a 45? I, no, it was, it was the actual rack that like on either side that like holds the barbell. And so oh I, damn, it, it did not even hurt. And it was cause that, you know, my fat ass tib just took the pain. So <laughs> beef on it. But, um, No, man, I really haven't seen much of that. The other movement that I've noticed is really underrepresented in resistance training is you don't see a lot of like resisted hip flexion, like in the Mm -hmm. the weightlifting. I see a lot of power lifters do that. So, oh, oh, not, not flexion. I'm thinking of abduction, adduction, right. It's like, you know, you think about like your squat, your deadlift, and even it's like whether you're doing quads or hamstrings, right? It's like your main compound for quads. What's that got to be? you know, a squat, you could say maybe a leg press for hamstrings. Um, you can bias a leg press or hamstrings on a leg press, um, a bit complex to explain without being on one, but, um, or, or like a Romanian deadlift or good morning. Right. So whether it's hams or quads, you're still doing hip extension. There's not really a lot of resisted hip flexion going on. And I feel like that would be really helpful with a lot of postural imbalance. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't know why, I guess, uh, you know, um, you know, whether it's your tibia or just like your hip flexors, like, I feel like those are both kind of underrepresented and not really sure why. Um, you yeah. know, I, I think it, physique doesn't have to have that, but the thing is, is I've never seen someone train their tibs, like they're training their quads, you know? So, mm-hmm. um, I, I couldn't give a firm answer there actually. Okay. Well, all right. This has been so great. Thank you so much for doing it with me. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I know you're, you're, you're taking online clients too now right yes yeah so i I, so i don't know how you are at training athletes like basketball players or anything like that but i would to anybody listening i i would without hesitation recommend you if they're interested in bodybuilding or weight loss or just looking better as a lifestyle client i can't think of any trainers that i've met who are better for that so And I will say for the athletes, you know, I think that's where I won't say just the physical therapy backgrounds, but I would say like the alignment of like my physical therapy background plus bodybuilding is like how I can apply it to athletes. And the main thing I would say is it's like, uh, 
uh, strengthening individual weak points in the kinetic chain that can really impact um, their force production and just their efficiency of movement. Like I'll give a good example: basketball player. Like if they're if their foot's pronating a lot when they're you know in their squats or just when they're walking, honestly, when they're running. If that's happening a lot, they're losing a lot of force production and vertical, uh, you know, and just explosivity, speed, all the above, just because that weak link. And so if you could, for instance, uh, you know, put them on a single leg leg press, but we're not trying to push weight with that leg press. The point of emphasis is to prevent the ankle pronation. So really set up your arch nice and firm, make sure it's elevated off the uh, platform, and then focus on holding that until you're at the depth of the movement. Cause that's usually where you see the pronation is when someone's uh, at depth, right? So if they can practice holding that up and then you just increase the weight from there only while meeting that condition that the ankles aren't pronating, then you basically can build them to a point where now they can handle their body weight and their force production without their ankles pronating. And so let's say if their verticals, you know, 30, you know, 32 inches, but they're losing a few inches of it due to that loss of force, you know, from the inefficiency of their ankles pronating. It's like you correct some small detail like that. And maybe now 32 is 34 or 35. Um, you know, maybe they're running a four, you know, a mid four five and now they're running a mid four, four, you know, um, and like a 40 meter dash. So, you know, that's just a small example, but there's lots of little imbalances that if corrected can just fix so many things. And I will say that one thing that I found interesting about bodybuilding more so as a natural, because with the increase in mass and honestly, just me not prioritizing mobility quite as much, um, this hasn't been as true, but I felt like when I was bodybuilding naturally, and then maybe in my first year of like using gear before I was consistently like in the two sixties and two seventies, um, I felt a lot more athletic and just like I moved more fluidly and even more coordinated. And I think it's because when your body, you know, your body has like a plan a, like a default movement pattern. And when certain things are like, let's say there's adhesions in an antagonist muscle or something like that, it makes it less efficient for your body to move that way. And it adopts a new, but less efficient movement pattern. I think if you can correct those imbalances and basically get the body operating in it's like default movement patterns, I honestly feel like even the, like the signaling, like motor neurons, like travel faster because they're all making one stop. They're not trying to do a movement and then being like, Oh, we don't have the mobility for that. And then, you know, delegating elsewhere. So I think it can even help with things just like, uh, reaction time, you know, um, coordination. And like, I felt like I felt that progression, um, as I emphasized correcting those imbalances a lot. Um, so that would be my main pitch to athletes is really just optimizing the efficiency of your movement and your force production. And then if we can actually do like strength building on top of that, like the results can be pretty phenomenal. So. Okay. Awesome. Definitely call me. So, <laughs> so your, your Instagram handle is the illest PD. Yes, sir. Just want to make sure I have that right. All right. Great. Well, thanks a lot, man. Maybe maybe we'll be able to do a part two sometime because I've got a lot more questions. Have me on here.